To answer your question, though, is it worth it? In short, no, I, I really don't think it is. And I own one. And, <laughs> and I think it's like one of my most fantastic guns that I own. It is, it is absolutely excessive. And for many people, completely and totally unobtainable from, from like a cost perspective. And it's a lot to manage. Like I've got my, I've got my uh, specific powder, a specific bullet, these modules, like all of this stuff is very much proprietary mm. and unique to that system. Let's do it. Cool, cool. All right. Jake, are you ready? Got that sound check? <laughs> just my my bullet. left ear, dude, just went, oop, wee. Like it's always ringing, but it's doing something. Oh, yellow, we've started. Jake, let's start over. No, no, we're not <laughs> starting over. <laughs> I didn't know he started the timer. Mark's, we're gonna, to, Mark's tonight is kicked in right at the last second. It was very distracting. We're not starting oh, over. Come on. That no. was such a good start. We're yeah, rolling. It been out. This would have been great. Really yeah. All of this makes the super cut. What is up, everybody? Mark on the mic here. Jim to my right. Mr. Paul Neese across from us and Mr. Ryan Muckenhern across from us as well. Jim, I don't know if I've ever been uh, across from so much knowledge. <laughs> have we yeah, had? Yeah. It's like a you compounding two on the effect. Equi- oh, my gosh. They're wearing the same thing. Uh, have we had? You two on the podcast at the same time before? Oh, I think I think it's it's oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, many many times. A lot yeah. of times, yeah. there's, yeah. there's other while. people here though. And, yeah, and they they pull the attention away from our very own Mr. Knees. Mm. Uh, but to quote Mark Boardman, we got them, people. We got them. Uh, we got them, everybody. Uh, yeah, we have like uh, knowledge squared. Uh, this is true on the on the other side of the table here. Uh, top, but Ryan, I, I almost said, point of order. I almost said N two, and then I realized knowledge is spelt with a K. <laughs> <laughs> and then that would be yeah. the, that'd be kind of funny though because it's, you're talking about knowledge, but then the spelling it and uh, I was close. Anyway. Right, got it. The joke. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jim. You know when a joke when you have to explain what's funny to a person, that's how you know it's funny. That's how you know it was a good one. Yeah. Uh, what if you haven't gathered? Which you probably haven't because we haven't talked about anything relevant right now. Unless you're watching on YouTube and you can see what we have on the table. On the table. They saw the title, yep. Mark. Oh, yeah. They might have read that as well. Uh, we're talking about muzzleloaders. Kind of specifically the three tiers of mud- muzzleloaders that we've identified. Um, boy, these things have come a long way. And somehow yes, they haven't they gone have. that far. Because, <laughs> because they still kind of all work on the same premise and principle. How they or I guess the end result, wildly different. The end result, wildly go. different. Wildly yeah. different. And yeah. the cool thing is, you can... It's in, uh, the, it's in the details, right? Yeah. It's in the details. You can still kind of choose where you want to fall as far as from like an experiential standpoint and what you're trying to get out of the hunt, what your yeah. what your goals are, your motivation, um, what you, you like to do, yeah. what, what, what you think is fun. Yeah, and um, if and if you hunt, I mean, you may be driven by state regulations too, because those come into play in some of these, which I'm sure we'll get into here. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. And then there, like you said, some state regulations require that it's basically as primitive a muzzleloader right. as they get. You know, yeah. talking flintlock yeah. type stuff. Mm-hmm. So, uh, everybody here has done some muzzleloading. A little bit. I got caught up in my schedule. I don't actually own a muzzle loader. And then I looked at the clock and I was like, Mark, can I still make this podcast? Because I need you guys to help me spend my money on a muzzle loader. <laughs> this buck that's on the table all the time, that's a little muzzy buck. That's a muzzy buck. Oh, very good. Jim, that's yours. Mm-hmm. Still one of one of the First most ever. fun hunts I've been on. That was a glorious day. You, me, and Ryan. Yep. Good time. And then we finally mm-hmm. hunted again mm-hmm. this fall. It's been a with the, ri- with the rifle. You guys shot some deer. Yes. Mm-hmm. So that's cool. Let's talk. Uh, let's talk muzzleloaders, though. Uh, what, should we? Should we just go through them one by one? Should we talk about how Let just us, the general operating principle? Like you you got to start kind of on this end of the spectrum, right? Because this yeah. is seems like, the like most that classic, would be a good start. Essential. Yeah. What everyone, if you haven't been immersed in the world of muzzleloaders, what everyone thinks when they hear muzzleloaders is. Arguably something that looks a lot like this, something um, that Mel Gibson may have used in the movie Patriot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. Conjures yes, up indeed. visions of something very traditional. Mm-hmm. Yes. Usually you want to make sure that you have a hatchet as your sidearm. <laughs> <laughs> a large Bowie knife. That's right. Yep. 
<laughs> I guess should we should we define for those folks who aren't versed what the three tiers are that we've identified? Please, Ryan, go ahead. Probably a good start. I'll say traditional, mm-hmm. and within traditional, we're going to go two different directions, and I'm going to get tomatoes thrown at me because there are people out there that still think flintlocks are the way to go. I'm the saying, most traditional yeah. of the traditional. And I'm saying that kind of uh, as a, a har har moment. My hat is off to you, gentlemen and ladies who can shoot those things. I can't. Um, you have traditional muzzle loaders, which are flint lock and or percussion. There's some very traditional muzzle loaders that still use like a match lock. Sure. Um, <laughs> now you're really getting down yeah. in the weeds on that. Yeah. And and um, those are that's a whole different level of enthusiast. But think typically lock operated. So side lock operated, I should say, and we're using either um, fire in the case of a match lock, uh, or uh, rocks, or a percussion cap <laughs> to to source our ignition. Right? Yes, and this is the classic one that's got the side hammer yeah. that someone pulls back and cocks. I think people probably have a pretty good picture of that. Yeah, that yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so states like Pennsylvania, for instance, still have a flint lock only season. Mm-hmm. That's a thing, and it's a big thing. Um, and and other states will will have some sort of primitive notation to their muzzle loader, and and there's a, a lot of various mm-hmm. varying degrees of what that means, and it could just mean loose powder, um, bore diameter bullet, uh, i.e. no sabo, mm-hmm. um, and open sights, um, or it could mean something like uh, the rifle I have at the end of the table there. Montana has kind yep. of in, in recent years added a traditional muzzle loader yep. elk hunt yep. to their. Yeah, I think you can structure. do. I think you can do all. Yeah, I think you can do elk, mule deer, and pronghorn. Oh, really? In that, I didn't know they added it for all. Of them. Yeah, I guess maybe I just. I, I believe it's it's the tail end of the season, and it's it's carved out for those big game species, and you can you can hunt them with that uh, that style of muzzleloader. And I have plans for that. I have a I have a really good plan. I will discuss it off air because it is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't want to share that yeah. with the general uh, yeah, population. Yeah, great idea. Um, so traditional muzzle loaders, uh, we're going to lump them into flintlock and percussion, uh, for, for the sake of conversation. And then we would have what we would call a modern inline muzzle loader. Uh, and the name, uh, the name's in the name, I guess, right? Uh, inline meaning the ignition source is, is in line with the powder column and projectile, not dissimilar from, a, uh, say center fire cartridge or shotgun or something like that. Um, the, the primer is, is typically housed in a, a breech plug of some sort. Most of these guns these days are hinge action. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's other varying styles too, right? You can get a bolt action mm-hmm. version. You can get a, a, a falling block. You can get a couple different things. But um, they, they typically will utilize a uh, 209 shotgun primer mm-hmm. as source of ignition uh, and then loose or pelletized powder underneath the projectile. They uh, look just like a single shot rifle. Yeah. Yeah, you and, know, you kind of have mm-hmm. to. It, it's not until you start, you know, opening up the action or the the break in the middle that you start realizing, oh, wait a minute. You see, there's a breech plug in there. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Where do I, uh, where do I yeah. put my cartridge? And then I suppose we'll graduate to the top of of the pile, and we'll call them um, high performance muzzle loaders. There you mm-hmm. go. And the state of the art. Yeah, and they usually use uh, well, they use a variety of ignition uh, ignition sources. I'm seeing a lot more of them utilizing um, like a module that mm-hmm. contains typically a large rifle primer. And this will I'll identify three. Um, there's the Remington UML, UML mm-hmm. which uses kind of a modified 308 Winchester case that looks kind of like a 45 ACP case primed mm-hmm. with a large mm-hmm. rifle magnum right. primer. Right. The CVA Paramount, which uses a priming technology called a Varia Flame Primer. Um, which is a large rifle primer inside of a steel sleeve that resembles loosely a 209 primer. And then um, the Arrowhead large rifle uh, magnum primer module, mm-hmm. um, which is, is catching on. And, and now I'm seeing a lot more companies uh, that are building guns like that, utilizing Luke's technology for priming. And I think it is not only novel, but it is a force multiplier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a very efficient way of of, yes. of loading and firing with that. Yeah. Uh, I'm so fanatical about that that I actually have a large rifle magnum primer module modification done to my modern inline, which is a hinge action gun. Interesting. You, you know, could, I was just going to say, Ryan, you could you know you could sort of walk your way up through those those three basic 
primer methods. Maybe you could give a little input on that. So the most basic one was using a percussion cap. Sure. Then yep. you went to the to the shotgun 209 primer yep. and then the large rifle magnum primer. Um, I assume as you progress up, those are those are getting hotter, uh, offering more ability to ignite a, a load. Is that yes? As you progress up that. Yes and no. Actually, it's a weird thing. Um, so percussion and musket caps. So we, I think Mark actually brought some examples of musket caps. I got some musket caps. My uh, my first uh, Remington muzzle loader yep. was set up for musket caps. Yep. And so the musket they cap fam- they they worked famously. Yeah. Mm. So they mm. they offer a little more. Uh, pizzazz than a, a standard number 11 percussion cap. They're a bit larger. Um, and if you look at them, they're, they're not terribly dissimilar in size from a 22 LR as far as like mm. diameter goes. Mm-hmm. Um, and wouldn't you know it, you stick a bullet in the end of a percussion cap and you end up with a 22 uh, LR, mm. like mm. The, the origins ah. of. Uh, and this this fits the same nipple that no I, no so it's so, a different yeah mm-hmm. a musket nipple would be a larger diameter nipple so like a, a number eleven percussion cap is a tiny thing very very difficult to to hold on to and manipulate and feel and move um, the percussion cap offers or excuse me the musket cap offers a shooter a, a little bit bigger more manageable yeah. priming agent um, but they are different and they're different enough that. For some reason, number eleven seemed to have eked out in popularity the or the musket cap, which is bizarre because the musket cap is so much easier to manage. So here's and, what here's what I would have thought, or this is how this is how I remember the muzzleloading primer evolution. Like it was like number elevens, yep. And then I thought, and, and then maybe I have this inversely in my head. Then I thought like, oh, let's use these musket caps, mm-hmm. and then 209s. Mm-hmm. But was it musket caps, number 11s, then 209s is kind of what we saw as the evolution? 11, musket, 209. Okay, mm-hmm. I had it right. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Okay. Um, this was, I think, also superseded in popularity by the 209, right? So the, oh, 100%. The, the 209 became such a common priming system, and, and from like my infancy in muzzle loading, which I think is around 05-ish, um, like 209 was, was the mm-hmm. way to go, unless you mm-hmm. shot a traditional muzzle loader. Right, right. Um, I had my box of uh, 209s staged to bring, and I checked my backpack today, and I don't, <laughs> they weren't in there. Well, and the 209 is a, check your it's uh, traditionally like a shot shell primer. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yep, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that went a couple different ways. So, Knight made the disc rifles. So, so I was going to bring this up. Earlier, yeah, because I had for a short stint a night to uh, disc extreme, yep, which had that uh, like that red plastic, mm-hmm. you know, module, module I mm-hmm. guess that you, mm. which boy, it was kind of a bear to get those things in. I thought, sure, uh, but then I thought it was kind of funny because like we went from, uh, I feel like we went from uh, kind of like the uh, you know the, the number eleven and the musket and then the the two oh nine into the module and then like we got away from modules mm-hmm. in a lot of ways mm-hmm. but then you get into these super high end muzzle loaders back to a module yeah yeah it might help to to let people know what when you say module so everybody yeah, kind of knows are what you you're talking about, about. Yeah, so it would help i think module. people maybe understand that a little <laughs> bit better I, I was late to the recording and i have on my desk a tube full of lrmp gen 2 modules i yeah i had them at home and didn't bring they're, them to they're yeah. they're not more than 90 feet from us right now just not present <laughs> um so the module what mark was referring to with the disc rifle is you know when you got the macaroni with shapes and there were some <laughs> round ones and they had like some interesting uh, geometry in them yeah, they look kind of like an old wagon wheel yeah, yeah, yeah that's kind yeah. of what a night disc module looks like and was that still intended to hold a primer of it, some sort it is was yeah the... so it was a vehicle for the primer to go in there the idea was um, it's easy to manipulate, hold, and feel, mm-hmm. and then also offers environmental protection. Mm-hmm. And uh, yes, yes. it was a very novel idea. And the, the disc rifles are still kind of popular today. I would say wildly succeeded by the 209s. But for for a period of time, they represented absolutely the pinnacle in muzzleloader technology. Oh, 100%. Mm. Uh, the, the rifles were and still are built with you know, a huge precedence on, on shooter and creature comforts, accuracy, and, and they are bonkers accurate. 
they're they're almost now obscure enough that they become somewhat proprietary though mm-hmm. and and so you know with the with the advent of of modern inline muzzle loaders that use these hinge breech designs and and just use a simple 209 primer they're generally much more affordable their accessibility has has you know bolstered their popularity over the the disc rifles and then that that style of priming kind of went away so we have then 209 is kind of the standard it nestles right into a breech plug it's like literally take the 209 primer put it in the thing close the gun and go is that hard to manage at all because like i'm it picturing is, a primer uh, i was yeah. just gonna tiny. say it's still a pretty yeah. tiny thing and yep. it's easy to fumble it and drop it cold yeah. fingers especially yeah. a lot of muzzle loader seasons up around these parts are in the latter part of the year and right um if you're wearing a gloved hand a 209 primer is not a large thing to <laughs> monkey with so then on to modules. So what, what Paul was alluding to is what is the module? The module, and I guess we're, we're singling out the Arrowhead Rifles module, it looks like the back end of a, like a, a cartridge, right? In, in that it, it resembles if we took like a 4570 and we cut the last three-eighths of an inch off of it. And so it looks like a little rimmed, stubby, short brass case. Mm-hmm. Luke's have a stem that come out of them it's a short stem I'd, I'd have to get a measurement on it i'm gonna i'm gonna say it's around probably a quarter of an inch perhaps mm-hmm. um that stem or excuse me that module you prime with a large rifle magnum primer mm-hmm. and you can do it on your reloading press that's how i do mine and they can be reprimed Multiple any number times. of times yeah. Yeah. yeah and so again it's a vehicle to carry and deliver the primer primer to the the rifle's action it's a very manageable vehicle. It's larger, easier yeah. to hold on to. <laughs> They're extremely robust, and I think they, they do a couple of things. They provide an unbelievably tight and efficient seal into the breech plug, preventing what's called gas slip, where we actually have exhaust gases from the propellants driving rearward out of the okay. gun, eking you know, inefficiency out of the system, um, robbing you of a little bit of velocity. And then if you <clears throat> were to chronograph these rifles, you'd, you'd see... The module guns are very flat. Like the best SDs I've ever fired have been out of my module rifles, of which I've had three now. You're talking about just muzzle loading or like ever? Ever. Like oh, that's impressive. SDs yeah. of Jeez. SDs yeah. of one. Jeez. And ESs of three. And pretty impressive. Yeah, numbers. it's it's really cool Jeez, to think about. Out, yeah. yeah. When Paul was asking earlier, you know, has the tenacity of the priming compound increased like linearly with the the advent of technology the 209 could be observed as the hottest um you know a lot of force in a 209 primer um, especially if you're using like a magnum shot shell primer less so in the large rifle magnum primer arguably more consistent in the large rifle magnum primer and then luke's uh, i mean aside from his the guy is one of the most intelligent people I've ever met, and, and he's a, uh, an, an engineer by trade, an enthusiast of, of hunting, um, you know, by upbringing and passion. When he was looking at, you know, where, where are battles lost with high-performance muzzleloaders, he generally looked at the inefficiencies of the systems at the time. One of them was flame gap. So from the primer to the propellant, the amount of space that was between those two things, like at the ignition source to the propellant, um, you know, at the, at the base of it. He figured out a way to narrow the flame gap to like a minimum dimension, um, thus delivering the most flame, the hottest flame to the source in the most consistent and manageable way possible to get spectacular reliability out of Ignition right. and, and then consistency. And I assume a, a much more efficient burn out of the main yes. powder charge then. With, yes. Yeah. And to back up on 209s, they're, they're so powerful uh, as a priming source that when pelletized powders came out, and specifically like the Pyrodex and 777 products that were uh, cylindrical disc with a hole down the middle of them, the hole was two parts. One, uh, like movement and management of the item. They sent you a little pipe cleaner mm-hmm. in the pack. You could stab it in the little hole and bring it over to your, your barrel so that you weren't touching and potentially contaminating the propellant. Two, to increase surface area to help with burn because they're relatively bore fit. They're smaller than bore, but they're relatively close to bore. Mm-hmm. A hole through the middle, we've now got more surface area that we can expose to the flame. An interesting thing was observed. Shooting 
pellets with that form factor to them with full bore 209 primers, the flame would jet through the hole, push the bullet forward before the ignition sequence could right. happen, yeah. increase the air gap between the heel of the bullet and then the propellant. We've get the, we get this cavity in here, and it's an inconsistent cavity shot over shot. Right. And we have wildly inconsistent velocities, poor accuracy, uh, and, and sometimes, like, misfires. And, it's like and, you're shooting the gun twice. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's like, a secondary mm-hmm. ignition. The first time is almost like a squib. But. Yep. <laughs> it, like, boom, yeah. pop. So what they did is they toned down the 209 primer, and they, they reduced its tenacity by some percentage. I've, I've heard, you know, anecdotally 10%, 25%, 50%. And the idea was, is we're not going to be um, kind of false starting projectiles into the lands and grooves uh, upon the ignition sequence. And then we then had two distinct 209 primers. I was just going to so was that done specifically for muzzle loaders? Yep. It was. Yep. Interesting. That yep. I did not know. So That's Remington, interesting. Remington had the clean bore ML primer, and it was, it was expressly marketed for muzzle loader use. And then 777 had the... Um, uh, a 209 primer that was a muted performance primer. Now, if you shot loose, it didn't matter. So that's so that's what I was going to say though. Like, yeah. do you have a, a specialized primer there for pelletized yes. powder charges yeah. that you don't necessarily or you wouldn't necessarily want to use if you were using like loose powder, like Correct. like loose triple seven or yeah. or uh, you know black horn 209 like we have on the table here. Yeah. So when I got into Muzzle loading was inline, modern inline first, um, and I shot TC Omegas, mm-hmm. and graduated to the Encore, but actually found that the Omega was a overall, I think, better system for a number of reasons. But um, I monkeyed with pellets for the first bit, and I was out on the range one day trying to collect data. I I I'd, I'd gotten my first chronograph, and I was trying to really be as much of a, a, a scribe with this process as possible. Because on, on paper, I understood that this would offer me definitely better performance than 12-gauge slugs, which is what I could hunt my, my area where I was from. And I noticed that my chronograph data was getting bizarre and more so as the day went on. And I replicated this. I'm like, what the heck is going on here? And what I had found is that the pellets were affected fairly dramatically by atmosphere and time in it. And that their their inconsistencies really showed up the longer and longer and longer I played with them. They were sometimes difficult to contend with. The burn rates didn't seem as good. And this is, again, this is a long time ago. This is almost 20 years ago. And so I switched to loose. I said, okay, well, whatever. Um, the internet was kind of new at the time. There were forums out there and uh, guys and gals talking about muzzle loaders. And I, I actually got talking to guys that were shooting rendezvous. So they're shooting very traditional muzzle loaders, and they're talking about the consistency of pure black powder, like real black powder, and how basically they're shooting all day, and the most effort they're having to put into this is they're swabbing their barrel every you know mm-hmm. twenty shots mm-hmm. or something like that, and how consistent and consistent and consistent it was. And so I said, okay, I'll concede to that and I'll shoot loose. Through this new modern inline, I was really bonkers about this triple seven that was marketed as not you know, not fouling your bore up or whatever. And I think that's baloney now. Um, <laughs> you, you, you'll get, you'll get five bullets down your bore. Yeah. Um, and, and then, you know, bust out the solvents and the brushes and, and the, the patches and that. Um, but when I switched to loose, most of my problems went away. Mm-hmm. Um, and the consistency elevated tremendously. And then it probably would have been around 2006 or so, when a powder came out on the market called Blackhorn 209. And um, at that, yep. 2006, 2007, yeah. at least that's when I started carrying it. When it came out, I guess I'm a little foggy in the details. No, I think, because yep. I, yep. I was at uh, Cabela's in Nebraska yep. about that time, and that yep. was like the first that I'd heard about it. And, you know, you, caught, you talk about the powder evolution, yep. or like, you know, maybe my personal powder evolution. But it was yep. like I used Pirate X pellets, yep. then loose 777. Yep. And then everybody, like, about that time was like, no, 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 no. Like, <laughs> There's this something is better what you want to use. Yeah. And so I remember I had to convince my boss that we're going to carry this powder. And I think a bottle of 777 was probably about 20 bucks for 16 ounces. Um, and Blackhorn 209 was 40 bucks for 10. 
Yeah. <laughs> and and he, he kind of laughed at me and he said, it'll never fly. We ended up carrying, I think I was probably the only consumer of that stuff for the first year uh, in the shop. But I then found out that these muzzleloader primers that had muted performance wouldn't ignite them. So I had to go back to regular 209s and 209 Magnums. Mm-hmm. And, uh, which is like, that's mm, a really mm. important note though, yeah. oh, because yeah, is. if yeah. you want to use Blackhorn 209, which is a fantastic powder for like a modern oh, yeah. line, I think we'll pretty much all recommend that. Yeah. 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 Um, but then you go to the store and you say, yeah, 209 muzzle little primers, let's go. It's yep. like, nope. Check, check yeah. the fine print yeah. there. Yeah. The, the only way I've seen those work is on, on guns with breech plugs that are of course dished. So there's a b- big distinction there. There's there's differential um, like design elements in in breech plugs. Some are optimized for the use of pellets. Some are optimized for the use of loose and especially blackhorn, um, where their flash hole diameter might be slightly larger. They have a, a distinct dish milled into them to allow a shortening of that flame gap. So we're going from the priming compound to the propellant in a shorter distance. Um, I've seen those with very deep cavities can sometimes touch off with the the muted performance primers. Mm. Cold weather will about nix that as a reliable thing, right? Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to shoot Blackhorn 209 out of an inline, um, you're going to be shooting a full full strength primer. Mm -hmm. Um, We we see that uh, every year. Now, Uh, because the powder column is loose, mm -hmm. it's not allowing that flash from the primer to go straight through it and then do that kind of like uh, pop boom thing that the it would do with the pelletized the muted stuff, right? the muted primers just don't have the tenacity to ignite blackhorn. No, I, that's what I'm saying. So yeah. when you do mm-hmm. have blackhorn and you yeah. do get the super souped up whatever primers, those would cause that little like pop boom thing with the pelletized yes. stuff. But then with the blackhorn, because yes. it's loose, it blocks that from getting to the bullet. Or so something? you you end up with with. Actually, or it more just surface ignites area ignites faster, so then it, yep. you don't have the chance for the the pop from the yep. two hundred nine to actually get to the bullet before all the black horns already ignited anyway. Yeah, you have more surface area with loose, right? Mm-hmm. So think of a sphere. We'll, we'll just pretend that loose black powder is perfectly round. A whole bunch of spheres in a column mm-hmm. versus two cylinders in a column with a through hole through them. So right. that mm-hmm. surface area allows ignition to occur more reliably, um, and then. With, with all that, then the chain goes. The well, correct. and you're also like full yeah. bore diameter too. Mm-hmm. Yep, you're filling the cavity up mm-hmm. completely. There's no, mm-hmm. there's not a lot of opportunity for slip around mm-hmm. um, that. Yeah. And um, but Blackhorn, whatever the chemical composition is, and it, it's still, uh, I think, a, a pretty tightly kept secret. Over the years, I've heard a lot of different things. I've heard it's a European shotgun powder. Um, I've heard that it's a, a, you know, a pistol powder or whatever. It's I've not. heard it's just ground up kings for charcoal. That, that could be <laughs> match light, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's 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 none of those things. It's it's produced in Canada, um, and it is magic. It is magic propellant, and and I, I will tell folks if they're like whether they're employees here, their folks calling in, they just start talking about muzzleloaders or customers stopping in. If if you're going to get into inline muzzleloading. Start with Blackhorn and never let anything else go down your bore, ever. Right. And, and Useful piece of advice yes. there, Ryan. So, like, 777 is a less corrosive powder. It is not a non-corrosive agent. Um, I've proven that. Yeah. Uh, Blackhorn does an interesting oxidization, but it doesn't seem to be corrosive, and it doesn't build up. Like, it, it is akin to shooting a high-volume shotgun like hmm. you 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 get debris in there but it doesn't plug the barrel and and to put that to the test i actually had a gentleman this is many years ago he's a friend of my dad's um was challenging me on blackhorn 209 and we were at the range and i i think i fired 53 consecutive shots it's all the powder and all the bullets and all the primer i had i never swabbed my bores and it was 53 consecutive rounds through a tc omega and I said, you just, I mean, you notice my load pressure didn't change, shot over shot over shot over shot over shot in iteration ad nauseum. Um, and it is that good. Mm. Yeah, it, that's it's, impressive. It's also wildly stable, um, which is really interesting to think about. 
it, it doesn't seem to be affected by atmosphere. If it gets wet, it can dry like real black powder, which is impressive. If it dries, it generally is okay afterwards, which is cool. Um, you've got a whole bunch of preloaded tubes there. Mm-hmm. I did the same thing several years ago. I got a couple boxes of those pre-charged tubes, and they're preloaded, and I'm not worried about them. Like, I take them out. Travis Brand and I have Wait, this. these are preloaded? We, we charged them. We oh, poured, we, we put did the powder. It. You, mm-hmm. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> we, we charged them. <laughs> I just about... Uh, I just about set the whole room ablaze. Yeah. Uh, so, but anyway, okay, got it. There, cause you Jim, this is a non-smoking area. Uh, my apologies. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to buy You have to figure out, you, when you muzzle yeah, it, you yeah. have to figure out your load. Yep. Now, I have uh, a question for you, right? Yes, I'm going to jump. Got it's got it. a little bit off a of topic. When yeah. you when you made that transition from pellets over to loose powder, yes, sir. Did, you, did you at that time... Uh, were you savvy enough to start weighing those loads no. out, or were you loading by volume, so which kind of ties into what we were just talking the, here a little bit? But. The initial, it was all volumetric, uh-huh. and I had a whole smattering of volumetric chargers, and they ranged from like the old brass pirate ones, you know, that you like spin out. <laughs> which that's, I still have. Yeah, that's yeah. what yeah, I, I have, have and that, those. that's yeah. what I used when I was running 777. Yeah, yeah. so I had those. Um, I had, I still have it. Uh, it was a TCU view powder measure, <laughs> and it looks like a syringe. Uh, kind of, and it's got a brass stem, uh, a rubber plunger, like a, a syringe would normally, and then it's clear and graduated, and then it has a swing top funnel. Now, TC's not really a thing anymore, and this has been picked up. You can still buy this product. You go to muzzleloaders.com, you just look up um, their powder measures. It's it's still there under a different label. Mm-hmm. I think CVA's got it now. Um and that was the one I trusted the most. And it, it took me, I don't know if it took me a year or so, but I got thinking there. I'm sitting there and I'm filling up these um, these powder throws. Yeah. And I'm noticing that, like, the more I'm manipulating them, the powder volume is <laughs> changing. Yeah. And yeah. then, it, and like, a yeah. light bulb clicked. And this yeah. is like the 15, 16, 17 year old version of me. And I'm like, well, hey, dummy, like, that stuff is settling. And so I'm like, well, shoot, how am I being consistent? And then I'm like, I employed like a tapping method. Mm-hmm. Like I'd fill it up and yeah. then it was like one, two, three taps. And then I called that good. And then it's like, oh no, you can just measure this like with a, <laughs> with a scale and we can do it right every time. And then I did. Yeah. And then I switched you to made using that, You made that transition. Scale. Yeah. And um, so it's funny. I, this is a no-no. Don't ever put volatile powders into an electronic measuring device. <laughs> So, i.e., real black powder into uh, uh, you know a very crude electronic measuring yeah, that device. That sounds like a good opportunity um, for an explosion. It could, <laughs> it could be. Uh, there's there's the equipment nowadays is much better, um, and I think it's safe to go. And like competition black powder shooters are all electronically weighing their charges, uh, anyways. But they're using a scale and some sort of mechanism to deposit that uh, in onto the scale. Um, so then I started weighing and when I transitioned into Blackhorn fully and, and wholly, there was no volumetric yeah. charging. Everything was all, mm-hmm. all based on weight. And I, it's funny, I, I've got a magic load, um, that everybody here uses. Uh, and, and it's not like I'm some sort of ballistician and figure this out. I just took the load that shot really good volumetrically out of my TC. Um, and I threw a hundred charges onto a scale and came up with the average in weight. <laughs> yeah. And then I said, okay, this should work. And threw it electronically, and it was like bonkers accurate, bonkers consistent. I've never deviated from it. And mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. probably the better part of 15 years of using exactly the same charge. So, so Ryan, did <laughs> question about muzzle loaders and stuff, and you not deviating from that load and whatnot. Yeah. Like, um, do you use that load in every muzzle loader you touch, basically? or di- No, di- in lines only. Okay, so excuse me. Every inline muzzle loader you touch, because we talk about it all the time, how yep. rifles will all shoot different. So, yep. like, what load works for me might not work for Ryan's. I mean, Mark's six five green mark. Yep. You know. Yep. But like, you just toss that in any inline muzzle loader, and they just tend to work. They, uh, I don't know how many we've done. I'm going to say it's somewhere between twenty five and thirty five. And they all seem to just be magic. It Do they have like different a, barrel lengths and mm-hmm. things? And yep, yep, yep. It just seems to be a consistent, forgiving yep. load. You know, it, it's and not, it's funny you talk about you talk you're talking about volumetric volumetric charging. Yeah, 
And I just remember doing that. And, and I think in my head, I was like, well, it's a somewhat crude device. Yep. Like it's how quick, much. It's a, it's a quick and easy way how much, of but it's sacri- quick, sacrificing consistency. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. and, but I'm like, well, how, like, what am I? I'm probably like not losing or gaining much by, in fact, at the time, I didn't even, it didn't even cross. That's just how I did it. I had this thing and yeah. that's how I measured my power. Yeah. But like you said, from a consistency standpoint, yeah, sometimes you got a little bit of a hump on top. Sometimes you're pouring it in the barrel and some of it, you know, <laughs> spills in the transfer. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and then uh, I think we'll get there with some of the stuff, but with these wade charges, mm-hmm. my Lord, the consistency. Yeah. I, I mean, we're yeah. we're taking, so the inline that we have on the table right now is a CVA Acura MRX. Um and it's not a it's not a notoriously expensive rifle, and they even have less expensive versions uh, of the Acura MR and and LR and formerly PR that were like really accessible, otherwise looked at as quote unquote cheap guns. Travis Baran holds, I believe, the record of the tightest group I've ever seen fired with a muzzleloader, and he didn't do it just once; he did it multiple times that evening. It measured point oh one eight inches. And we were using swaged bullets and that charge weight. Can you okay. put a thing on Pretty the good. end? Yeah. Can I? What thing would you put on the end? Um, any. F- so that gun's a fifty. So mm-hmm. you need you'd need a specialized muzzleloader, or excuse me, a specialized suppressor that would accommodate that bore diameter. The forty-five caliber guns are much more conducive for putting things on the end. Um, and so I'll throw one out like a hybrid forty-six M. I knew Silencer Coat was. I have, a hybrid, big, I have a hybrid 46. Yeah. yeah. Oh, really? I remember yeah. when Silencer yeah. Coat made the integrated thing. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, I, I want to back up on volumetric powder charging because um, it just, I for the past 10 minutes, have been rambling like an idiot about how bad it is. When I shoot my uh, percussion gun, every single one of those charges is volumetric, and that gun shoots like a... Like a house fire. Well, that's what I was but wondering. You, you probably have a lower expectation of longer range accuracy. hundred percent. Ab- right? Absolutely. Yeah. Like yeah. I was telling the fellows before the podcast, like a hundred yards is doable with it, and it's 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 famously accurate. Fifty yards is I'll touch. I'll put three balls, cutting the radiuses of the subsequent ball or previous ball, uh, shoots exceptionally well. Uh, that gun's out of gas at about a hundred yards. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I had these illusions that I was going to hunt pronghorn and mule deer with it out to 200 and it just simply doesn't work 150 is about a 50 percent hit factor like it's it's a, a a poor it's a poor thing but brian what gun is this that is a petersoli rocky mountain hawken it is a 54 caliber patch and ball gun it's pretty it's lovely it's one of my most beautiful guns it only shoots these balls it doesn't shoot any of these modern looking pointy things huh it, there are projectiles out there that you could shoot through there that resemble more of a conventional bullet shape. The mm. the challenge with that is those guns are twisted mm. completely different than other guns. That it's has matching a, the twist to yeah. the bullet. Yeah. That has a one in sixty six twist. Tremendously slow. Yes. And if we look at the kind of more original formulations for twist rate, I guess when we started using math, um, Regularly, because guns have been twisted since the 1500s. So yeah, I like, think math was invented a little before that. Yeah, <laughs> like optimization of twist rates called a Greenhill formula. It's it's one of a few ways we can arrive at what is a, a good rate of twist. It has much more to do with length of projectile than it does weight. And mm. so the ball is very squat, right? Well, and really, only a point of it is touching. Very small band. A of very it. small. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Mm. Um, it's like a it's like a tire. Like a tire can be really big, but only a little tiny piece of yep. it is touching the road. Yep. And so if you if I were to switch to a conical in that gun, and I do know shooters that have run conicals out of those, and they seem to do a pretty good job. There's a little bit more concession to be done. There's fitment that has to be matched correctly. Oftentimes, there's a, a different lubrication component that has to be taken into consideration. So like. I shoot either a spit patch. I take a cotton patch of a certain diam- or certain thickness. It goes in my mouth. I take it out. I set it on the barrel with the ball. I seat the ball. I ram the ball down and fire it. And so you're works. voluntarily putting moisture into the barrel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And works fantastic. Um, you could also use a different type of lubricant. In the wintertime, I don't shoot a spit patch because spit freezes almost instantly. I use mink oil. 
Um, there's also other products that are out there. There's like Wonder Lube and, and um, a, a few other like beeswax mm. slash cooking oil slash. WD-40. Uh, I don't know if they've used <laughs> WD-40, but they there are mm-hmm. quite a few folks that use industrial, like petroleum-based lubricants. It's generally considered a no-no. But My man Hank Hill would use WD-40. Sure, sure. Uh, <laughs> But you could shoot you could shoot a conical projectile out of it. They they loosely resemble what we see as right. a modern projectile now. Mm-hmm. You mentioned the patches that you use in this yeah. thing, and I, I don't mean to deviate because I know we were talking a ton about powder. There's probably more to be spoken about powder. Uh, you use the patches in this thing, like you said, a spit patch or something mm-hmm. like that. It's like a cotton patch. Yeah. Do you use the same type of patches in these other two rifles? I've seen you guys use like the veg veggie. Oh, the veggie wad. Yeah. Wads and stuff like yeah. that. Is that... But like so, you have to use a wad, right? You have to? It yeah, depends. That's a different... It depends. Uh. Yeah. So, on the round ball guns, you, you wouldn't shoot a, a round ball bore contact, or you, you, you shouldn't from like an accuracy, consistency, and fouling perspective. So, the patch accomplishes a couple of things. Um, one, it protects the bullet from uh, extreme deformation. Two, it protects the bore from extreme fouling. Three, it provides a very tight seal uh, so that we get obturation, Luke Horak. Mm. Um, we, get, uh, we get consistent. You, uh, explain or define <laughs> obturation. Obturation <laughs> is if you have a projectile that's made out of an alloy of some kind um, or, or some metal, you fire, that projectile changes its shape and it pops out to seal the bore. Upon sealing the bore, the rest of the chemical reaction that is occurring at the powder column occurs correctly, consistently, and efficiently. That seal then generates pressure. That pressure then pr- pr- uh, pels the projectile down the barrel. Essentially, it's referring to the bullet that it's being squeezed into yep. the barrel, yep. and it's kind of mm. forming itself to the barrel. Bingo. The inside and of the barrel. engaging the rifling, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. Um, the, the, did I say the patch cleans? Because the patch cleans, too, while we fire the gun. Um, we get a seal. Uh, protects the bullet, protects the bore, and and in general gives that rifling something of purchase on that projectile to help initiate spin stabilization. Um, if I didn't shoot a round ball and I shot a conical, that conical would be a bore contact with lubricant on the conical itself, and that would kind of take care of the other things that the patch does, um, different fit. Moving into the modern inline, um, you could shoot a patch round ball out of the gun. They operate at higher chamber pressures. They operate at higher velocities. You're probably going to shred the patch. So as I mentioned, the patch is cotton. It's, it's fabric. Um, some folks will use canvas, like artist's canvas. Um, and there's, I mean, some folks have used leather uh, mm-hmm. to, to do that. It's a very tough patch to shoot, generally speaking, smaller diameter balls out of larger diameter bores. Um, What's the twist rate on the, the modern, the, like the, the center category here? They're, they're faster than one in yep. 66. One in 48 to one in 20. Gotcha. Mm. Yeah. And then, and the, and then the, the, the top tier stuff, I mean, now we're talking pretty one much in, one in 20. One in, one in 16 one? to one yeah. in 22, yeah. maybe. Fat, faster and still faster. Still, yeah. well, I mean, still significantly slower than yeah, a center than fire. Than a center fire rifle, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah cartridge rifle. Uh, so I think very interesting. that MRX... The 50 cal is a 1 in 28. The 45 is a 1 in 22. Sure. Hmm. So that you speed that twist up. You get into the inline, though. You could shoot a patch ball. I don't recommend it. This is where we saw Sabo technology really kick up. Um, so we're taking, at that time, in, in the periods in which they really got hot, you were either using full bore bullets um, that were made out of lead. Some people shot what were called TC maxi balls or um, Lyman Great Plains Hunters and things like this. But we started putting pistol bullets inside of polymer mm-hmm. sleeves. We call them sabos. That's you know. about the time I started into yep. it, doing that. Yeah. And so the polymer sleeve is taking care of all the things that the patch was doing. We're using a conventional or more conventional projectile. We're upping the ballistic performance by like a factor of 10 comparatively. Um, and they're actually really convenient to shoot. A downside to them is, is you were depositing plastic into the bore. That only stood so long until it had to be removed. Um, you could get some tilt in in the projectile and the sabot during the seating process. The sabot could be damaged during the seating process. 
um, or the sabot could deteriorate while it was moving down the barrel, and you'd have like wild accuracy degradation. But in general, they shot very well. I actually mm-hmm. goofed around. I had an encore. Um, again, illusions of hunting mule deer and pronghorn with muzzle loaders for no reason um, that I duplex sabbated. So I had two sabots to get to a much smaller bullet diameter, and I monkeyed around. I probably still have this thing. I have a 25 ACP primer conversion that used a 25 ACP pistol case for the primer for this TC Encore. And that was the that was the deepest darp- darkest depth of rabbit hole that I've ever gone into. And That's I'm awesome. here to tell you now, it really was a pain in the butt. It does yeah, a sound... double a double sabo sounds yeah. really interesting. <laughs> yeah. That's got to introduce so much inconsistency oh, in the fit. That, it was terrible, yeah. terrible. Um, and then sometime, you know, probably in the early 2000s or so, a bullet company uh, came on the scene called the Power Belt. Mm-hmm. And so this is a full a full bore bullet that eliminated the sabo and replaced it with a skirt. Mm-hmm. The skirt. So this similar. I don't actually have Different. an example. I should have brought some. I don't know. I had it was, some. It was, what you know, are we doing? I don't know. I brought what I use now. Yeah, and the the power belt is was a quantum leap in accessibility and performance for recreational muzzle well, And they just loaded <laughs> and and still oh, do yeah. load. Yep. Just famously. Yep. So they're they're slightly undersized. The skirt obturates, fills the bore. Mm-hmm. It's made out of a durable material. It seemed different than the Sabo material that we had conventionally at that time. We didn't exhibit the fouling characteristics of typical Sabo material. Um, very accessible bullet, inexpensive bullet. They were a clad or um, plated bullet as opposed to a full jacketed bullet. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's some contention around that, and it, it's it's not unwarranted, but it's an effective projectile. And actually, Eric killed a deer in uh, Nebraska a few years ago. I want to say 264 yards, something like that. Yeah, with with his uh, his CVA and uh, a run of the mill power belt, and the gun shot outstanding. It shot sub minute at 100 yards. We used the magic charge, and he killed a deer at 264 yards with it, and folded it like a five dollar yep, ten. Deer didn't go anywhere. Yep. That bullet came out, and people started thinking differently about. I I think, anyways, people started thinking differently about um, optimal projectiles for muzzleloader use, and and that full bore. Yeah, it, and, and, those and came, now you're you're sort of leading into about the time yeah. Luke and yep. you mm-hmm. know guys like him began to get into that next level yeah. of bullets and accuracy. And so, and we've talked with Luke about his kind of history into this, but at the time he was in Iowa, and the power belt wasn't a bullet necessarily designed to function at the velocities that Luke wanted to achieve shooting um, guns like the Savage 10 ml and the Remington um, 700 ml. This was pre advent of the UML. Um, and the Sabos were the Sabos and they did their job. Uh, but, you know, he fought with fouling and he fought with all these things. And he thought, okay, well, what are the cruxes in, in this design? Um, and it, one of them was the projectile technology at the time, just not being able to stand up to the rigors of what he was looking to do, shooting these high-performance muzzleloaders. Um, the priming technology not being up to speed and up to snuff. And then, you know, what what do we use for propellant? Are we still going to use Blackhorn? Are we going to use 777? Are we going to move into smokeless? Mm-hmm. And know? then that, and then that, you know, that uh, topic of, you know, fitting that bullet yep. to the bore of the rifle. There, yep. he, he saw that there were places to improve that. At which point, he started swaging bullets. You would, let's say, you had a fifty caliber muzzleloader. You'd buy, buy a bullet that was point five zero zero five diameter, and then you'd use a swaging die that would incrementally size that bullet down, 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 to a perfect bore fit, and perfect bore fit. And then you'd put it on top of a big pile of smokeless powder or a very big pile of Blackhorn two hundred nine. A and, small powder, a small pile of small, yeah, powder, so relatively well, small maybe, and and then you were moving that projectile at thirty out six velocity. Question, oh, sir, why does it seem like the concept of fitting the bullet to the bore is so tricky with muzzle loaders when we do it all the time? I thought with center fire cartridge rifles. Great question. You know, and, like, why and, does he have to go through all this stuff? Like. I'm just thinking you got a 50 caliber 
or why don't you just stick a 50 caliber bullet down it? You know, like why do you have to go through all the swaging and sure. all that? So you, when you when you look at a bore, like a rifle bore, there are two measurements. There's the measurement at the top of the land, and then mm-hmm. there's the measurement in the groove. Yes. And like you can see the difference. You look down your rifle's bore, and you'll see that difference. In a centerfire rifle, when we're operating at 50,000 plus PSI of chamber pressure, and we're launching that bullet in there, that obturation seals that to a perfect fit. You can't put your bullet down your muzzle. I was, I was just going to make that point. Yeah. If you envision, let's say you had your center fire barrel and bullets, but picture if you had to if you had to drive that bullet down, okay. you couldn't you couldn't yeah. do it. I guess I've never you tried. Yeah. It seemed yeah. like a yeah. dangerous thing to yeah. do. Yeah. And and only because we're loading it from the other end of the gun, right? You can't force the bullet down there because there's at the at the time of ignition, that bullet gets engraved and pounded into that rifling for as perfect a fit as possible obturation occurs at the case level huh. and then sm- like forces it down there and imprints and cuts the grooves of, of rifling into the bullet itself and we found bullets like out at the range you know and they've got the perfect imprint to the rifling in there you you physically don't possess the strength to stuff your bullet down down your bore i did not realize yeah. that and so by doing the perfect bore fit when he when luke was swaging bullets you get the part down the bore that needs to go down the bore Upon ignition with this giant pile of powder, um, obturation occurs, and the remainder of the seal happens, and then whoosh, down we go. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, and in, and in doing so, like bore variance is a thief of many things in in muzzle loaders. Uh, it's a thief of consistency, of accuracy, uh, and velocity. To have that fit as as mechanically perfect as possible before we start having interference. Um, you're you're mitigating the amount of of theft that can occur in those fields. Yeah, and I think Luke also he I mean, and he probably still does. He typically uses very high end barrel blanks, yes. right? It's yes. not it's not uh, it's a higher level of consistency and tolerance. And, yes. Yeah, he just know. can't afford to use something with lower levels yeah. of consistency yeah. and yeah. such, huh? Yeah. yeah. So and, it's it's funny because like a lot of people, I mean, think of muzzle loaders as being so simple and so classic, and then really actually in order to get them to perform highly it's quite seemingly complex and tedious and expensive it can be yeah Yeah. so i'm gonna i'm gonna back up again this is the most erratic i've been on a podcast in a while (laughs) full bore bullets yeah full bore bullets like the power belt come out and a few other companies i would say are generally slow to adopt and whether it was for marketing purposes or whether it was just trying to work out the engineering behind it, um, a couple other famous ones that I fell in love with were like the Hornady FPB, which is now discontinued bullet, mm-hmm. um, the Federal Borlock MZ, um, which I think is barely hanging on by a thread. Um, now Hornady has their bore driver mm-hmm. that, that is similar to what the Borlock was, but their the the FPB was a full contact bullet with a uh, copper skirt on the back, like it was a concave backed bullet. It looked like a Manet ball. It was. Hmm. I would almost hmm. describe, if you've seen a power belt bullet, yep, which has kind of like that concave plastic skirt. Yep, it was like the bullet was also the con. Yes, it the was concave the concave plastic skirt yep. on the rear. Yep, like it was just one piece. Yep. So bullet had a concave base to it. Um, it there's another bullet company out there called Thor Bullets. Which are were, are a custom contract of Barnes um, that oh, yeah. that emulate that same design. So mm-hmm. you have a, a concave back on the bullet, if you will, concave base. It's called. They shot those um, FPBs shot well out of my oh, yes. TC Omega. They yes. shot really well. Yes, and they were heavy bullet too. They were a 350 grain projectile. They were my favorite for a long time, and and I've shot many, 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 many packs of them. Um, killed a lot of game with them, and always really enjoyed them. Um, but if there's one thing that the full bores didn't give shooters, it was ballistic coefficient and trajectory. Be- sure, because, because they, they were, were so heavy. They were huge bullets. And this is why Sabos hung on and still do hang on um, in modern inline muzzle loading as well as they do. Because we are going from, say, a 50 caliber bore down to a 45 or a 44 um, caliber, caliber bore. bullet yeah. yeah yeah or we're going from a 45 down to a 40 or sometimes even a 375 um, and you you end up re- kind of reaping the benefits that we would see in the center fire analog where we're necking a cartridge down to take mm-hmm. a smaller diameter higher ballistic coefficient projectile potentially and putting it into play and so the sabo 
is, is still a, a, a really good tool for that if you want a little flatter trajectory, a little higher velocity, a little bit better ballistic coefficient out of that projectile, higher sectional density for penetration. Um, and the, the full bores were more of a convenience thing. And I think for those in the know that that married well their expectations with reality on inline muzzleloaders offered a better solution. And so, like Mark had alluded to, he and I both have hunted deer with the FPBs for a long time until we couldn't get them anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, Jim killed this buck with a federal bore lock, a you know, full bore diameter bullet. Um, and that was at a pretty extended distance. I, I think it was in the mid twos that you'd shot that critter. I don't remember. I think it was 220. Okay. It was, it was, mm-hmm. it was a poke, right? Yeah. Um, for a muzzle loader by, by many standards. Um, and then, so now we'll fast forward again and we'll jump into these modern projectiles that we're swaging. When you look at, um, a which power, hold, like hold, I guess that would be both the two on one? the left, yeah, there, like, or yeah, my yeah, left. Hold that. So looking at at these two specifically, one is made by the Fury Bullet Company. It's called the Star Tip Two, and it has a very respectable uh, the, the one, black the black okay, one. Oh, yeah. got it. It has a very respectable ballistic coefficient. It has a fantastic jacket design, a fantastic core design, and that's a fit to bore bullet. And so, does this one require swaging? I see it, the texture. It does. It does. Yep. Okay. It almost looks like with that with that texturing that you might not have to swage that. That that if, would give enough give to the. If you had an open enough bore that could accommodate it, and and many TC bores were on the kind of open side of things, you may not have to. But Wait, you, you can. I'm sorry to interrupt on this, yeah. but okay. So if you get these fit to bore mm-hmm. bullets, you may have to swage yourself. Yes. Oh, you don't. If, there is, there's no way to just buy bullets. It's like, oh yeah, I just bought it and just stuffed well, it. Down. If you're lucky, there if is, you're lucky, you can. There is now. So I'd mentioned I had three module guns. I had, I had two smokeless builds from Luke prior to the advent of the Obsidian rifle, and the barrel builder that he was utilizing and still does utilize at the time, and the bullet manufacturer. There was like a disconnect between them, and you'd have acceptable bore variants that wouldn't be detrimental to accuracy. And then you'd have acceptable variants at the bullet that wouldn't be detrimental to accuracy, but the the marriage of the two was Combo. complicated. Yeah. yeah, and so the first two guns I had, I had to swage the projectiles to fit. Over time, Luke, being Luke, figured out what what is the plus minus on the bore variants and what is the plus minus on the on the bullet variants, and he has it narrowed down to two. It's called NSR S and NSR L. So you have no mm. size required bullet small diameter, no size required bullet large diameter, and his barrel manufacturers can can match that um, tolerance. So what he'll do is he'll get a gun in, or a, excuse me, a barrel blank, and again we're talking about m- very minuscule tolerances. Mm-hmm. He'll gauge pin or or f- check fit that bore, designated as this. That gun uses these bullets. These bullets fit this gun. I can mass produce these bullets. I can mass produce this barrel, and that's good to go. You have an NSR small barrel. Okay, got, and so in that case, you can buy the bullets and just stuff yep. them down. The thing mm-hmm. I'm confused about though is like, how do you know when you get a muzzle loader and you are going to use these types of bullets? Sure. And so you would need to swage. How do you know what to swage to? It's a hand fitting. So try try sort of yeah. a trial and error process of. So curiously, Mark's CVA did not like the size bullets. Do you know that when you're just trying to push it down the front end of the barrel, you're like, oh, this isn't going to go. Two parts. Fitment manually and then firing. Mm -hmm. And so... Oh, so there does come a point where you just have to like buck up and just shoot it and see if you blow your face off? Like when we were (laughs) side... Oh, hopefully not. Hopefully That's the thing about muzzle loaders. It's kind of weird. It's like, just just for somebody who doesn't know what the heck you're talking about, I'm like, Okay, it's a, it's a sketchy now there's stuff that I have yeah. to do, and then I'm just going to try it and see if it works, yeah. stuff it down the barrel, and hope I don't die. Kind of. I, I mean, it, it, yes. Understand this, though. It's actually an extraordinarily safe procedure. So you you your loading procedure practice should go powder bullet primer. Yes. And that thing is inert until that primer is installed. Okay. Right? So as long as, as, long as you don't put the primer in, you get over the anxiety component pretty quick. But... I mean, yeah, like if you really squeeze the bullet down, you're like, okay, let's load this thing. It goes, funk. You're like, okay, let's not prime that one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when when we were setting up Mark's gun, um, 
this was a new rifle. So we had gone from the Acura MR to the MRX, and they, they had changed the board dimensions um, enough that sizing the Fury Star Tip 2 bullets yielded poor results. And we tried everything. A lot. We tried extremely loose fit, intermediate fit, very tight fit. Mm. And nothing nothing changed. What I think is occurring, and this is this is my opinion, I can't tell you this that I've measured it. There's bore variance in those guns. And it's almost like they have a tapered bore, slightly. They're more open towards the, the breech end of the rifle and they constrict towards the muzzle end. And if that's the case, they don't seem to be as receptive to the size bullet. And we've, we've played with this theory a couple times. Um, and we ended up with the same result each time uh, in that the swaging of the bullet did not yield the results that we had seen in the, in the previous generation of those guns. Or at least this bullet. That could be rectified with a different bullet. And what, right. were, what, and what, were, what were the barrels when you were doing that? Were those a high-end barrel or were they factory a factory barrel? A factory barrel, yep. which probably explains part yep. of that. And I think part of... Part of the, the the formula of Luke's success in yep. in using this is that he's using, he, I believe he just really only uses high end barrel Very, lengths. Yeah. To, no. You know. I will point out though, like on that MRX, I mean that's a Bergara barrel. Like, yeah, it's a it's, it, it's a it, really it good barrel. Yeah. yeah. And once we found the bullet that shoots, like What's remember, MRX? which one's the MRX? That the one. The middle one. Yeah. The middle one, inline mm-hmm. style. Yeah. Okay. With Travis Baran's gun, he has the. MR, or the the predecessor to the MRX, that's the gun that shot a .018. Mm-hmm. And I've seen that gun shoot yeah. routinely quarter minute of angle. Mm-hmm. Routinely. And we're using size, size, size to fit bullets. Weighed. The gun had an MSRP of, I believe, $449. Oh. And we're getting chronograph results that are every single time, single digit ES, single digit SD, mm-hmm. every time. Mm-hmm. And size to fit bore. Um, and it's like a somewhat ritual that he and I have every year. We meet down at the range and we ch- throw charge weights and chronograph muscle And, uh, you know, to, to jump back to your question, Jim, like swaging the bullets is, it's actually a pretty easy process. It's mm-hmm. not that, I mean, and I'm trying to recollect, it's been a while since I did that on, on a, on a yeah. rifle that Luke put together for me. But I think what I did is I started with a, with a fairly tight. So in other words, when I, the, the bullet was obviously too loose. And then progressively just open that swager up slightly, slightly, slightly until I got to the point where I felt the, uh, you know, I was getting enough resistance pushing that that bullet down mm. that it just it, w- it was kind of a feel thing. You know, you were looking for something that it, it couldn't go down too easy because once that bullet was down there, you wanted it to stay put on top of that powder charge. But yet it had to be, you know, you think about a, a field hunting condition. Maybe you've already fired a couple rounds through the rifle. It has to be easy enough that you can consistently load it again yeah. without fighting with the thing. Right. So you're kind of just, but it's it you know it sounds complicated. It really wasn't terribly yeah. bad. It's a it's, little homework up front. And and once you've done it, once you've found that size yeah, for that set. barrel, you're done after yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of tough to describe like that. That pressure. It that, is. That's that you're, hard. Like, it is. A, it's a feel thing. It's yeah. not uh, like you said, Paul. You want to be able to load it. You also need to put a little, a little at least a little bit of yeah, like there's, behind it, like there's, and you want it consistent too. Yeah, like, sh- yeah. It's just got to have that kind of right feel to it. And like I there's remember torque we, wrenches, but there's not like ramrod wrench. Yeah, torque, we like. we we did a hunt one time where we had we were running one of Luke's barrels and a swaged bullet, and I don't know, you know, I remember we got to the point, and I think the barrel was slightly fouled, and we had we had cut it too tight, and got to the point where we jammed a bullet. It just you know, Stopped. you felt like you were going to break the ramrod off trying to push it. And that was the end of that. We had to take the breech plug out, hammer the bullet back out of the bore. But obviously, a you know, a really bad situation if you were hunting because yeah. it mm-hmm. was over at that point. You weren't getting off a yeah. second shot. You're definitely looking for that sweet spot. Yeah, yeah. Which takes some... Yeah, you it's know, kind of it's yeah, some it's, it's, plans, it's a, some probably a little bit there. of experience is helpful there. Someone who sort of knows, you know, the Sabos kind of gave you that fairly yep. easy yep. feel with a Sabo. Pretty, you know, they had a I think a lot of leeway in, yes. in what worked and what didn't work. With the, the plastic was very easily deformed and. So Jim, you had asked a question a little bit ago about shooting with a uh, over powder wad, a veg wad, and in, yeah, I think that's what we used on our hunt. We did. For that guy. And on the swaged bullets, it seemed that that was a prerequisite for success. Um, 
and so whether, it's not it's not like a mandatory you got to use one thing not necessarily I don't think I use them on mine cold, I think mine shoots pretty well without them cold weather occurs. ignition is a challenge with Blackhorn 209 Luke will recommend a veg wad with Blackhorn 209 to make sure that it, it it's contained environmentally sealed generating the proper pressure obturation can occur and the gun fires a certain amount of of sealing against moisture too right yes. when you have that yep. uh, just a little bit of additional Mm. When I'm running smokeless out of my smokeless gun, no. Um, when I, when I do the the size bullets in my CVA, it's it's a veg wad. I alluded earlier. Mark's gun was repulsed by the swage bullet, and Fury also offers an interesting bullet here called the Universal Fit that has a nylon, like a washer that's actually, like mechanically fit to the back of the barrel. Mark's gun went from abysmal accuracy to stellar. With I mean, it was it was a ragged hole at a hundred. Yes. I mean, it was for sure an MOA gun. Yep. And and I'm going and off memory than. and 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 better. Better than. What yeah. Do, what does that nylon washer do? So that's what's giving us our our um, bore fitment. So the bullet's slightly undersized. The mm-hmm. washer's slightly oversized. Oh yeah, I see that now. It it self so probably probably loads really easily, right? Just like yeah. So to me, it loads with that ideal pressure yeah. Yeah. that I'm looking yeah. for. When we went to those, like we said, obviously we saw a, a dramatic increase yep. in accuracy and performance. Man, they loaded great. It's a bonded bullet. Uh, comes in 285 and 320s. Mm. Um. They're I, w- I was like, Eureka, we found it Yeah, with that. And, mm. and they shoot extremely, extremely, extremely well. Um, and Eliminates the need for the veggie wad. Yep. And so that's a that's a pretty cool bullet. And then this, again, we're still talking about modern inline. So budget we rifle. We haven't gotten to this thing yet. No. Budget-ish rifle. Um, a little bit of uptick in performance from, um, like, the powder. Weigh, weigh your powder. Don't volumetrically charge it. The Blackhorn 209 powder stands on its own. It's just simply the most fantastic inline muzzle loading propellant ever created. Um, and then, you know, pairing it with a bullet. And you take that from an okay rifle that people had when I was starting in this. If it shot three minutes of angle, that was about what you expect. Let's go hunt. These things perform like your 308 does when you get the right combination of bits and pieces. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Where, where they fall off is at about the 300 yard line. At that at that point, it's over. Like wind will be the greatest enemy of you your whole life at that at that point. Yeah, and everybody can probably tell these you know these bullets are all a flat based design, yeah. which you know they they definitely have their ballistic. Even though they may have a long pointy nose mm-hmm. to them and a, yeah. and a and a relatively high BC for that type, you're still dealing with a mm-hmm. a fairly inefficient yeah. bullet when mm-hmm. it gets down to it. Well, I just I'll I'll add one thing to like that uh, CVA accurate mrx once we got it dialed with that load and that bullet and we were weighing the charges we were seeing sub 10 feet per second yep sds yeah. the accuracy like we talked about was phenomenal uh, i mean just the, the the consistency was just i mean really mm-hmm. staggering yeah. yeah for pretty good for a a package that's very within like modestly priced yes absolutely an incredible amount of performance yep. at a modest price, yeah. topping yep. it, yeah. topping it with, uh, you know, uh, either uh, you know a capped rifle scope, or you know, if you go through the process of getting your ballistic data for your muzzleloader, which we'll probably get into. Mm-hmm. Now mm-hmm. you've got a very efficient, semi-long range. Yeah, I mean, three hundred mm-hmm. is not out of the question. Oh no, very, yeah. very in, yep, in the question. Yep. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I just I. Man, I look at that and I go, man, that is a sweet spot mm-hmm. of price yes. and performance mm-hmm. where a person can do yeah, some yeah. pretty serious yeah. work. Yeah. I'm just happy Acura got into guns. They're, they're, oh, <laughs> Jimmy, that was a car joke. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> he doesn't even smile. smile. He just no, looks at me. He's just, just like, yeah, and? <laughs> oh. I was like, for a second Jimmy. there, I was like, I don't get it, but I'm just going to go with it. Somewhere there's a... <laughs> There's a cheaper version with a slightly less uh, nice synthetic stock, and it's just Honda. Honda on it. It's yeah. Honda. Yeah. <laughs> I'll add, just from a features perspective, yeah. adjustable cheek piece on there, too. Mm-hmm. Stellar yeah, like that's we've awesome. Got, we've got a I rail on that. it that's going to push the optic up, you know, maybe a touch. Boom, you got the adjustable yeah. cheek piece on there. Bingo. Jimmy, that was really good. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, that was good. <laughs>
So thanks, Ryan. I think they're really gonna <laughs> like that one. <laughs> So we were playing uh, <laughs> playing a little golden tea a lot over of golden uh, tea at deer, deer camp. camp. Yeah. Um, so then you get to the, about the top of the inline performance, I think anyway, at about the Acura MRX and LRX. I think they're unquestionably the best performing gun on the market space in that style, period. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with, uh, I would say, close to a couple dozen of them. Mm-hmm. Or actually, more than a couple dozen, maybe between twenty-five and thirty-five of them over the past couple of years, and they're nearly infallible. I I, I would say, and and they've got some models outside of what we have here. Like you said, this is the MRX. There's the LRX, which I think has a twenty-six inch barrel, twenty-eight inch, yeah, or twenty-six, twenty-eight, somewhere there. Longer maybe, barrel, maybe it's twenty. Longer barrel, yeah. Yep. I'm trying, I, I've got it in my notes here somewhere, but longer barrel, increased velocity. Um. They have the Paramount Pro. Well, that's a whole different animal. And the Pro mm. V2. But I'm just saying that that's an animal that is probably more similar to, like, this Arrowhead it's, rifle. It's I think the Paramount resides in between, well, I would say favoring more towards the side of the Acura than, than the, the okay. Arrowhead. Mm. The, the Paramount... And rifles like Remington's now unfortunately gone UML mm-hmm. are what I would consider like a, a high performance muzzleloader, bolt action design, Magnum capable. And and so we're gonna hang the Magnum name on there, but that's gonna mean a couple of different things to a couple of different people. You're gonna stop observing controllability and and potentially stop observing really repeatable accuracy at a little over a hundred grains by volume or you know, probably 75 to 80 grains by weight of powder out of a rifle like the Acura, right? I've run them up to 75 and been pleased with them, but much over that and you start to lose something. You're going backwards, diminishing returns. Enter a gun like the Paramount, which is a bolt-action rifle, looks like a Remington 700. It's a $2,000 gun. Yep, yep. it looks, it, it's their B14, basically. That's a muzzle loader. Um, from from CVA or in Remington's case, the UML was a 700 that shot muzzleloader projectiles and what, loose powder. What, what what happened here? What is this pronounced? What ha- what happened with your resolution right there? It almost looks like this is like an inappropriate image or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Screen blurred. Screens all <laughs> so screens the, all blurred like MTV Spring Break or something like that. Like. <laughs> The Paramount allows you... Parental, you parental controls. Printouts are failing me, John. You had parental <laughs> controls on the printer. The Paramount allows the shooter to shoot 150 grains of volumetric charge weight in Blackhorn 209, which is a ton. That's, um, a, that's a stiff load right yeah. there. And and if you're weighing it out and you buy a pack of Powerbelt DLRs, you pick up a, a Paramount Pro and you start looking at what their charge weight allowance is, what they recommend, it's a ton. And you're you're upping the performance values and and the the recoil threshold by a considerable margin as well. But we're moving from, you know, appreciably seventeen to eighteen hundred feet per second uh, of observed muzzle velocity into the twenty two to twenty four hundred foot per second range. Mm. Um, twenty four being quite optimistic, but possible. Um, and and this is this is extending the maximum effective distance by a couple hundred yards potentially um i i won't go on record as saying of how far i know people have killed things with paramounts and umls um but 500 yards i think with an idyllic day and good optics and very robust data is not out of the question Mm -hmm. um it it's optimistic but not out of the question uh but that's still 400 feet per second to 500 feet per second slower than what guns like the arrowhead rifle mm. are putting out. Mm. Okay. So they they they're a, a better performing solution for a long range enthusiast than say the Acura is, but they are they're not even in the same category or league as something of, of like a Paramount or a true smokeless muzzleloader. Or excuse me, not Paramount, an arrowhead or a true smokeless muzzleloader. And mm-hmm. Luke's Luke's not the only game in town that produces smokeless muzzleloader. Hanks Precision. Um, there's a couple other Gunworks um, has a phenomenal uh, solution too, um, but they're very, very different animals, and they come at a wildly different cost. Much, much more expensive, much, much more to hold on to, and like my gun, 
the one that Jim just held up, if you're watching, um, it's a it's an arrowhead obsidian. It's a 45 caliber bullet. I don't have to size them. I can shoot smokeless powder, which I do on the regular when I do shoot it, which has actually been a while. It's it's a extremely high ballistic coefficient projectile. We have one on the table here. It's got an aluminum nose cone on it. It looks like a, a ICBM. Um, yeah, like a really old yeah. school Take, drawing of a takes a special spaceship. jag to yeah. even push those things down without deforming the bullet tip. I'm moving that bullet at 2,800 feet per second. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. And that is the starting load. Jeez. So, uh, with, I haven't this, even... with smokeless powder? Yep. So smokeless yeah, that's... powder, that's the same stuff that goes into a cartridge. Like a... Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And if you're shooting that kind of powder, like also talk about then, I'm curious, the... Like cleaning and things like that. I mean, does your bore wind up just after a number of rounds looking like the same exact bore that you'd have in your six five Greedmoor? Like you just yep, keep shooting much. it and don't really yeah, worry about it. Yep, yep. exactly. Oh, that's nice. That is the a only very problem nice is if, if you're a hunter, most most states will disallow smokeless powder as a legal hunting load. Oh, yes. Load. Okay. So Got there it. is that. Got it. What's really awesome about guns that are smokeless capable though is that means they're absolutely Blackhorn two hundred nine capable. Yeah. And so yeah. I can I can snooze that thing up with Blackhorn two hundred nine, appreciate nearly identical performance as the smokeless loads. It's less, but still extremely yeah. high, 2,600 yeah. plus feet per second. Jeez. Um, and I'm shooting Blackhorn 209. I'm falling within the state game regulations. Uh, I have, whoa, just awesome performance, um, and I'm, I'm safe to play. Those, Luke will recommend getting them clean if you're shooting Blackhorn out, out of them, you know, yeah. between outings. If you're going to put it away for the year, you know, wipe it out. You're not going to see corrosion. You're going to see an oxidization and almost like a crystalline structure that occurs on the bore, like frost, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, it will also complicate loading a little bit. You'll have a different load pressure, and your point of impact is likely to be different. But when you clean them, your point of impact is also going to be different for the first shot, too. So um, get it out of there. Um, season your bore like you would you know, your regular rifles. And, and we don't want oil in it. We want it dry, and it'll be fine. But the... To, to circle back to the gun, something like that, or the gun works, or a Hanks gun, are are in a completely different universe of performance um, when when benchmarked against the others, including even the Paramount, uh, which is a very high performing firearm, and the Remington UML. Um, they they are just simply wicked. Paul and I were on our long range when the folks from Applied Ballistics came out and did the um, radaring of, of yeah, bullets. Doppler radar. We were shooting to 1,050 yards with our muzzleloaders yeah. and yeah. making with uh, great frequency and nearly boring. Very consistent yeah. hits, yeah. yeah. I mean, okay. that's just okay. like, it's just uh, st staggering the type of performance, yeah. accuracy, yeah. and consistency yeah. you can yeah. get yeah. with yeah. Can, uh, can I ask a question the right tools yeah. then about these? Yeah. So very cool. Yeah. Sounds awesome. High performing. You say that I I don't know if it's in every state or at least in many states, there's the issue with using the smokeless sure. powder, so then you can use the blackhorn powder. Yeah. And then you can still get, you know, pretty high performance. Yeah. I see that. But tremendous cost. Very mm -hmm. Tre pretty pretty it's tremendous equivalent cost. Equivalent to a high dollar custom center fire build. Right. Yeah. So I'm almost thinking to myself, like, uh I mean, if you're gonna wind up shooting blackhorn a lot anyway, like you know, I guess it's a matter of like, is it worth it to step up to something? Like that? Which is a, which is a personal question for yeah. people, and their and their values for it are going to be different. But like shooting the smokeless powder out of something like this, is there a reason for doing it other than just like, look at this, this is fun target shooting, and it's just crazy to think of what I can do with a muzzleloader? Or are there actually maybe some areas where you can yeah. hunt with oh, it? Sure. smokeless? Yeah. Oh, I okay. I hunt, I hunt seasons uh, in the U.S. that you can use smokeless. But, okay, are you taking advantage of the fact that it's a muzzleloader season, yes. or are you actually going out during the regular no, rifle season? I'm, and taking, taking... I'm taking advantage of the mm -hmm. fact that it's a muzzleloader okay. season. Got it. Mm -hmm. All right. And Just had to make sure. Yes. And and then I'm I'm reaping the benefits of the smokeless profile. Yeah. To answer your question, though, is it worth it? In short, no. I, I really don't think it is. And I own one. And <laughs> and I think it's like one of my most fantastic guns that I own. It is, it is absolutely excessive. And for many people, completely and totally unobtainable from, from like a cost perspective. And it's a lot to manage. Like I've got my, I've got my uh, specific powder, a specific bullet, these modules, like all of this stuff is very much proprietary mm. and unique to that system. 
And for me, I enjoy muzzle loading and I run the full gambit. Like I have a percussion gun, I have over a half a dozen inline guns, and then I've I've had three of these high end performing smokeless capable muzzle loaders. This being the piece de resistance of my collection. <laughs> um, but if if I was going to go back in time and I was going to say, Ryan, you don't need to do things eight or nine or ten or twelve times. You can just do it once and be happy. Knowing that a gun like the MRX is on on the like commercial palette, that's the gun you buy. Because ask yourself, do you plan on requiring a five, six, seven hundred yard capable muzzle loader? Likely answer is no. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would and, say and the you, answer, ha- you have the you have Mark, the, you Mark know, feels you, otherwise. You have the killing factor to think about too, and I've been involved in a number of long range muzzle loader hunts. Mm-hmm. Paul's there's a, a catalyst there's, behind there, me owning that gun. There is a, there's a point where you may still have the accuracy on the gun, yep. but the bullet performance, uh, as far as expansion, yep. and killing ability, and all that thing, I, I think they really kind of fall off yep. much quicker than a centerfire yes. bullet does. And hmm. um, I've seen elk killed at 500 yards with a a, a muzzle loader very similar to this, uh, and felt probably we you know really weren't getting the bullet performance at that range. That we, even though the rifle was entirely capable of doing yep. it, that the bullet performance was falling off yep. pretty quickly. At do that. you think that you could have through bullet selection had a different result? You know, maybe I think uh, we, we were we were shooting know. bullets very similar to this and. You know, the thing that I observed, it did, it did seem that uh, at some point those bullets tended to just sort of pencil through. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and they, didn't, they didn't expand. They didn't uh, have any shock factor at all. Mm-hmm. Um, still lethal, but you really didn't have that, you know, that, that mm-hmm. knockdown power that you would expect out of, say, a, a centerfire bullet. Mm-hmm. Um, and as Ryan said, I'm moving at pretty good velocities. Mm-hmm. I mean, those, those guns were, you know, muzzle velocities 2,700 feet per second. Wow. Yeah. So. Yep. Moving right along, but mm. I think they fall off. You know that flat base and design. The the bullets just they lose a lot more quickly than the. I think some of it though, like you could go back to like you could say like, let's say you're hunting Wisconsin whitetails, right? Um, yeah, a Ruger American would probably do you just fine for everything you need to do, right? But you might Can want confirm. a different mm-hmm. rifle for X Y Z, the sure. fit, the look, mm-hmm. the finish, whatever. And I think that comes into play here, too, or maybe where you live, how often you're engaging in that style of hunt. Maybe it is, maybe it does make sense for you. Maybe you got a mm-hmm. lot of coin, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, I just think there's, you know, there's a multitude of reasons why you, you certainly shouldn't mm-hmm. rule it out. No, I sense. wouldn't say yeah, rule no. it out necessarily, but I, I, to answer Jim's question and to, to look at the palette of, of hunts available to us, and like realistic distances that we'd likely encounter game. Sure. We'll take New Mexico. Well, actually, we won't take New Mexico muzzle loader out of the <laughs> That's equation. A, yeah. Well, so that was a point that I was going to yep. bring up, too. Yeah. So here, here's the thing I've got a friend of mine that went on an Ibex hunt in the Floridas with a Thompson Center Omega, and yeah. he killed a slammer of an Ibex. And so here's a gun that, for as long as I was selling them, was marketed as a 200 yard gun, and he killed that thing at like 128 yards. And I, I often see we maybe get the cart before the horse looking for performance, never realizing the need for it. Um, and oh. we, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's human and nature. It is. And sometimes I think that you can end up with a complicated solution to a problem that doesn't exist. And, and that is namely... True. Like, I do hear what yeah. you're saying. I own a muzzleloader that I've shot to 1,050 yards. And I, I have done the workups on it like crazy. I will never, ever ever pull the trigger on an animal at that distance i don't know that i'd pull the trigger on an animal at half, half that distance, half distance. <laughs> yeah why yeah. am i why am i walking around with it because i want it right right. There's, right there's that what what is need is a very different thing i think if i had a a viable solution to 300 yards and i look at the hunts that i have done and have taken part in and i'll i'll lean into paul for experience on this too as a guide for as many mm-hmm. years as you are yeah how many times is 300 yards pr- the probable window of opportunity? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really good point. I mean, and I think that's a very, that's a, a, a good ethical sure. number mm-hmm. to shoot yeah. with there. You know, I, yeah, I, I completely agree with you there. Wouldn't well, you, and, and also, you know, uh, <laughs> we talk a lot about long range here, long range, mm-hmm. that, this, that, the other. 
300 yards is still pretty damn far. Uh, yeah, I can confirm. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. yes. Killed, yeah. killed uh, Whitetail at a little over that this past weekend, and it was like, oh, man. Yeah. This is, you know, this is a segue, and I just got to say it. We, you're right. We do talk about long range a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. The number of opportunities <laughs> that I've had in, in my hunting career, predominantly hunting big game in the West, like as, uh, what I would feel I'm maturing into it like a, a real hunter in my own mind. The number of opportunities that I've had at game that I had, quote, the shot. And I don't know if I've talked about this in the podcast. And by that, I mean, I have the position to fire from reliably. I have the environmentals conducive to impact. And I have the, um, like, shot angle on target. Like, the animal is in a position that I can kill it. The number of opportunities that I've had in as many pronghorn and as many mule deer hunts and as many western whitetail hunts as I've been on, over the 500-yard threshold is far fewer than you might i mean it might right. it might be five right it might mm. be five it doesn't happen that often you can go out and seek that opportunity and like back up I've seen people do that that's t- it is it's a recipe for disaster yeah and most of the time on those longer distances that you're talking about it's almost always possible to shorten that sure. distance which is in every case desirable you know it just increases the likelihood oh, yeah. of a clean shot and a clean kill so mm-hmm. yeah. have you ever been on a hunt where you shoot something and you had the opportunity like oh my god how do we get it out of there yeah, oh, many times. Yeah. Many times. Yeah. 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 Might, I, I've I've observed hunters take long shots at animals across canyons and and it's so difficult to get to where they were yeah. shooting at. They don't follow up on the shots, which is of course hundred percent unethical yeah. and you know, but uh you know, terrible yeah. doing stuff like that. But you know, guys, when you talk those distances you can get into shooting places that are not easy at all to get mm-hmm. over to, yep. you know. And with I, I do think there's there's kind of like a magic window there too, like in that you kind of get into like, and this is like a personal thing where you're like, I'm uber confident at this range and and inside of that. So I could see there's situations where like, well, I could get closer, but I'm also within my max confidence level now I'm risking spooking the animal, an alert animal, True. maybe yeah. an animal that's moving away. Um, so really, actually, you're more, uh, you know, confident. Yeah. Higher percentage shot could be a little bit further away. It could be. So yeah, it like, could be. You're always kind of walking that tightrope of of where does that ideal time come mm-hmm. to to take that shot? Yeah. But with yeah. with this equipment in particular, there's a lot of things that stack against the shooter. Um, anti-conveniences to follow-ups, namely the fact that you got to load it from the front end instead of the back end. And yes. Even as as much as I shoot them and as fast as I can reload them, uh, it's like a minute, you know, <laughs> 60 seconds locked. Yeah, it's a slow, it's a right? slow follow-up. Particularly yeah. when your hands yes. are doing this yeah. the entire time. Yeah. And, and you have so yeah. many things working against you, even with the force multipliers that we see in the upping of technology, you know, from the patch round ball gun to the full smokeless gun. You have so many things working against you. Low for, you know, low BCs. Um, in the case of the the middle two or the the first two, rather anemic velocities. Um, as Paul had mentioned in, in his experience on the 500 yardish elk, uh, bullet technology that's not conducive for terminal performance, right? It's, mm-hmm. a, it's a 45 caliber slug that weighs 300 yeah. grains, yeah. but it's a 45 caliber pencil. Um, mm-hmm. so many things go into it. They're marginal, um, at, at the fringe, they're marginal. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have got to be sharp with them in order to make them work. Um, and that's where I think like 300 is a long ways away. And if you can get there with a gun that's as portable, affordable and obtainable and tunable as a gun like the Acura, for instance. Right. Oh, that's a sweet mm-hmm. proposition. Yeah, I think that's 100%. good advice. It's you know, it's been really interesting watching this from a you know a long time hunters and, and guides perspective. And one of the interesting things is the, you know, with this progression and ability with these muzzle loaders, that it's really it's gone sort of far beyond when when many of the states and and you know you guys know Western states are my big thing as far as hunting, but the it's gone really beyond when states envisioned muzzleloader seasons. There were some very 
desirable seasons put out, typically stuff that might fall, for example, right after the rut in an elk season, mm-hmm. um, sometimes better than a, you know, than a center fire rifle guy's tag would be. But the idea being that the, the, the weapon was very limited and short range and more difficult to kill mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. Well, it's kind of changed now with some of this stuff, this progression of distance and ability. And I think, you know, I, well, I know you're seeing it now in some of the states are starting to kind of re-examine mm-hmm. why they set those seasons out and, and the equipment that guys are using. And I know Ryan and I just kind of hinted at that a moment ago, but for example, in New Mexico, exactly. they recently disallowed rifle scopes on muzzle loaders, mm. which many guys are out there hunting with rifles like this. And it's an immediate, <laughs> you pull the rifle scope off of that, that thing. And now it's handicapped, you know, you yeah. have all that oh, ability, yeah. yep. but now you've, you've gone from a, you know, potentially a five or 600 yard killing stick down to probably 200 yeah. yards, yeah. you know, well, and, all of a sudden guys are shooting iron sights and, you know, when eyesight comes into play and it becomes far, far more difficult yeah. to make those long range hits. Well, and that's the thing where it's, you're examining the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. But then when exactly. people really start yeah. looking at the letter of the law and try to manipulate it and find loopholes, you keep having to make new rules around that because people yeah. can't just get at kind of the spirit of why it existed right, there. Yeah. Right, and like right. it's not the fault necessarily of the people who come up with the oh, technology no, like this because nature. that's really cool. But then it's also like, okay guys, like let's uh let's let's settle down here a little yeah. bit and try and remember what the point of this yeah. was. It it, yeah. it is interesting and I and I wanted to bring that up because you look at the, even like the evolution of like muzzle loader regulations. Like mm-hmm. for a long time there was like, you know, no scopes mm-hmm. and then it was uh well you can use like a no a, a no power or like you know like a one X yeah. type muzzle loader scope. Yeah, yep. Oh yeah. And the then muzzy. it was um well you know what? Let's let's allow yeah. you know magnified optics. But at the time and this and this would be at a time, you know, during the era of like the uh the modern inline, mm-hmm. right? Um I'd say I'd say when I started seeing a lot of states allow magnified optics was, you know, 15 years ago, probably ish, something when, like when that. When I started, when I started muzzle loading, yeah. I couldn't run a scope in Minnesota, so right. it was, mm. yeah. So 05 ish was no no go, and mm-hmm. it probably sometime in the yeah, 2008, 9, 10 time frame, they they allowed it. And some yeah. states have always yeah. maintained that, right. and some you know some, went to the and magnified some optics on the other end of the. But I think even at that time of like you know the the conveniences of the modern inline. They still were a relatively short range weapon. And and I would I would speculate that the spirit of allowing a made magnified optic was like the thinking was, hey, people are still gonna take, you know, essentially, you know, this distance of shot. Yeah. Let's give them the ability to make the most accurate yes, probably was, lethal yeah, shot. I'm sure and, that right? was, uh, yeah. And, and th- I, this predates, you know, uh, these modern projectiles. Yep. It predates really, or um, you know, early range finders in some ways. Uh, certainly, ballistic calculators <laughs> yeah, did not exist. Right. So bullet mm, bullet designs like these. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and I think that's why you're seeing like some of these states yeah. dial back, um, which definitely comes into play of your decision or your what you're talking. Well, do you need a muzzle or like that? Well, can you use a magnify that? Yeah. <laughs> right yeah. Because like, yeah. yeah. right. that's yeah. how you're gonna. Yeah, you you know you pull the scope off of this rifle here, and it's uh, it's lost a yeah. ton of its ability. All those I teeth it, and no toothbrush, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, yeah. It's yeah. you know what though, it's been super neat to see a couple of the companies, Gunworks and and Arrowhead Rifles, for instance, adapting to that. McWhorter would be another one. Mm-hmm. Yep. With oh yeah, McWhorter. Forgot about those guys. They build a phenomenal system. But so like Gunworks has a. I just want one from like the mechanical design yeah. aspect of the Revic iron sight. Oh, that thing's wild. Very interesting. Oh, yeah. it's beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, and Luke is working on, um, you know, finding the best fit for his clientele and, and base to utilizing a couple of other different sites that he has. And it's funny, I'm reminded we did a podcast on peep sites not long ago. Mm-hmm. Um, the Creedmoor style of shooting and competition that took place in the late 1800s, mid to late 1800s, where these guys were shooting milk cans at 1,500 yards with 36-inch barreled 4570s with flip-up tool-type sights. 
Well, I, we ought to go back in time a little bit and <laughs> investigate some very adept mechanical sites that did exist 150-ish years ago <laughs> and um, figure out how to incorporate Maybe, that. Yeah. And, and Revic and uh, um, the folks over there kind of did that with with their little uh, iron sight. And it's it's very neat, very novel. I think part, well, of, the, part of the thing yeah. is, like, when I'm looking at it, is that sometimes you just kind of let yourself just hunt different, though. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Just, like... It's like if okay now now we can only use iron sights. So let's try and soup up these iron sights to the point where they're like fifteen hundred yard capable iron sights. And it's like okay now we're just back to the same spot. Like like when you're in your center fire cartridge fired rifle season, go ahead and hunt and take game at three, four, five, whatever, how many yep. hundred yards. Yep. When it's bow season, take one at forty yards. You know, like if they started making bows that yeah. all of a sudden like were basically rifles and could put a deer down at 550 yards, then that would kind of ruin the whole bow thing. Yeah, of course, you know? now, in fairness, <laughs> as we all know, that that argument is going on very much so in the archery world. Well, too, yeah. With traditional compounds and crossbows, yeah, right. it's exactly the same mm-hmm. story and we're so talking it, about. Here. Yeah, it's kind of and scaled different. down. Yeah. And it's kind of yeah. like, it's in if if you're in it for the, the sportsman, like uh, just kind of having a unique experience, it's like, let let yourself have a center fire rifle experience during center fire rifle season and then let yourself have a unique muzzle loading experience during the muzzle loader season that that is my personal view i know some yeah. people will see it different I, no i would agree but that's with where you i'm kind of like too. okay well yeah. maybe it would be fun to just go in the field and not have all of the bells and whistles that i have yeah. available to me with yeah. the center fire rifle yeah. and go mel gibson style on a white tail <laughs> like that that maybe state, that would yeah. just be fun that statement is what hooked me up into muzzle loading because I, I became a bit dissuaded by the general whitetail hunting public in the area where I'm from. And I was tired of listening to volley after volley after volley of <laughs> shot, people getting into fights over spots and deer. I mean, it's like, I just, I, I want to hunt deer, but I want to be well, yeah, a no different experience. Yep. Value the experience. Yeah. I started muzzle loading. I'm hunting in December in snow and I'm Not the many only, others around. I'm the only weirdo out there. Oh, that's exactly what got his talons <laughs> into me. I fell in love with that. Mm-hmm. Fell in love with that. Yeah. And it's exactly, you get one shot. Even a high performance as that arrowhead is, one shot. Still, well, yeah. And I mean, also, like, you know, we're talking a little bit about, like, you know, why would you muzzle load in some ways? Um, you can draw sometimes better tags. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's just an extra season. Yep. You know, yep. Like even, mm-hmm. you know, here in Wisconsin, if you haven't filled your gun tag, uh, i.e. like me. Cough, cough. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you got the time, you can go for that, for that muzzleloader yeah. season or, or yeah. you know, states like, um, you know, other states are western states are mm-hmm. some are, have their seasons structured like that, too. So it's just like another opportunity yeah. to, mm-hmm. to fill yeah. that unpunched yeah. tag. Yeah. And I think some of what probably drove some of these very high end long range muzzle is you touched on that, Mark, the fact that um, some of those states allowed very, very good seasons for muzzleloaders. Yep. In other words, mm-hmm. the guy that's after a, a big trophy class animal, well, some of those muzzleloader seasons actually provided a better opportunity than a, than a rifle season might have. And I think then, you know, guys in that frame of mind probably looked at, you know, they want to maximize their chance to kill a sure. big trophy elk or deer, whatever it is. And then that kind of starts to steer you towards buying an expensive high-end mm. muzzle loader that that's going to maximize every possible bit of range that you could get so it's it is definitely a complicated you know topic that you can just circle around. <laughs> very <laughs> vicious yeah. Yeah. Well, it is. And, yeah. it, and it can become somewhat of literally an arms race right oh, because yeah. if yeah. the people yeah. that yeah. are hunting yeah. that same area have these tools and you don't you're at a disadvantage good point um yeah. it's, it's almost like you'd be in a lot of ways just as happy but it's like oh you want to say no scopes but you can still use an inline great we're all in the same playing field yeah yeah you yeah. know mm-hmm. yep. so yeah, yeah. I feel like uh I'm going to head on down to my local dealer and see if I can take advantage of any sign and drive events uh, with the with something like the Acura there, um, and then but could that's we do two, like that's two cars? Could we do like a could we do like an episode on? Well, you got a muzzle loader now. What? Because I still all of the many asking things for a friend, t- <laughs> asking for a friend. Because a lot of the things that go into this still 
weird me yeah, out. I do, I do want to point out one thing, though. Yeah, yeah. Like, and, and we were talking, to, you brought up peep sites, right? Yep. And like CVA here, you've got the Paramount Pro 2, you know, listed on the website, 19, 1920 to 2065, right? Very yep. specific. Month, but offered uh, in, with a package with like a Williams peep site. Is that, the, is that don't they have one called the Colorado? Was that is that what that um, is? Or one of one of them did anyway. I don't just know. Uh, I don't know. Kind of specific to uh, Colorado's muzzleloader regulations. Um, but the, but herein you have a very high performance muzzleloader, mm-hmm. uh, but with a, I would say a more capable than average, you know, peep sight open sight system. Sure. Um, which I just I think that's cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love this yeah. page, Mark. <laughs> it's yeah. cute. It's cute. It's like a lot of white, and then just like a little picture of a gun. Beep. And then the price. It's all you need to know. It's really all. I, it's all you need to know. Five stars. <laughs> oh no, reviews yet. Somebody should write a review yeah. on this. I'd love to read it. I think we've uh, well, we've scratched the surface. <laughs> we, we nicked it. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of a. Little bit Might of Might have gotten through the clear coat, but maybe that'll buff out and we'll have to come back at it again. I, I agree <laughs> with you, Jim. You should go down. Uh I'm I'm thinking I'm I'm gonna tell you that as glowing a review as I can give for a gun like the Acura, that's that's uh that's a phenomenal place to be. Somebody's then, gonna be really confused. I'm like, you got one of them Acura MDXs? You got a what? <laughs> TLX. TL. No. RSX. What is it? Integra. I'm gonna get an Acura Integra. <laughs> But it's a place that you can, that gun, that price point is you can just stop there and be content for about 90% of everything that you'd run Mm -hmm. into, maybe more than 90%. That is nice. And if you feel that you need to scale up and get into something like a Paramount and unlock that other 200 yards of potential performance, that's an easy jump as well. If you feel you want to go completely to the top and and get something like an Arrowhead... That's easy to do too. Um, they build more every day, but I think that that accurate solves most of the problems uh, Neat. that exist. Neat. Yeah. Get Good a 50 advice. In the accurate. Good advice. Cool. All, All right. <coughs> well, we've scratched the surface. Ryan, hopefully, we'll be scratching down a couple white tails later this season. Yes. Perhaps with muskets. Wouldn't with muzzle nice? loaders. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll see. Time will tell. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, thanks everybody for listening. Yeah, hope you enjoyed this podcast on muzzle loaders. Uh, gosh, they're fun. They they're are. neat, they're and hoot. and you can it's, I mean you can yeah. run them the most simplistic or the most advanced with all yeah. the bells and whistles and long range ballistic calculators it's, uh, and everything in between. Uh, yeah. Until until next time, catch you on the next one. Good luck all with right. your late muzzle loader seasons. Let us know how you do. Where do you fall in this uh, gamut of uh, Differing muzzle yeah. performance. What are your thoughts on season structures? Ooh. All the comments. All the comments. <laughs> Comment yeah, below. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, everybody. See you. All Bye. right. Thanks. Bye. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.